All right, everybody, let's get started. First and foremost, my name is Joey Johnson, and we're getting to know each other pretty well, aren't we, if you've made it this far? Three dollars. If you have not made a donation of three dollars, I ask you to please do so, just a one-time donation, and I would greatly appreciate it. Gram-negative bacilli. All right, so our first grouping on gram-negative bacilli is we are differentiating between H. pylori Campylobacter jejuni, and these lesser knowns over here, we'll just call them that, okay? So if you have a campiogar and it grows on that campiogar, then the next thing you're going to want to think is, is this Campylobacter or is it H. pylori? So then you can throw in some urease and see if it is urease, or not throw in some urease, but you want to know if it produces urease, rather. So if it produces urease, then it's going to be H. pylori. If not, then it's going to be Campylobacter jejuni. And both of these are going to be curved helicals. So let's go ahead to these lesser knowns, okay? These lesser knowns over here, really there's not much to talk about except for they're just oral flora, all right? So the fusiform, it can cause anaerobic infections like brain abscesses, but there has to be something that's really gone wrong for that. And bacteroides sometimes, it can cause um, almost like a false uh, alarm for being appendicitis if it gets carried away. It's normal colon flora, and it can uh, cause bacteremia, sepsis, um, abdominal pain. You're usually going to get this transmitted or something going on if you have a surgery or a knife wound and where it gets it outside of its normal habitat. So that's why we don't really care about those too much beyond that. So let's go over here to H. pylori. So H. pylori, it is urease producing. I would recommend you find out what all bacteria are urease producing. There are some good mnemonics on that. Um, the one that I have, I did not feel comfortable sharing, so maybe I can I can make up one and, and present a little later. So H. pylori, it is urease producing, and it can actually cause a maltoma, so that's important to remember. And direct the uh, drug of care for this one is you're going to have to do some combinations, all right? You're probably going to do like the ABC combination, which is going to be amoxicillin, bismuth, and like clarithromycin, or you can obtain an OMB or capitalize there, a metro, because you'll use metronidazole, you'll use omeprazole for the O, and then for the B, you might use bismuth, but just know that there's going to be a combination of things you're going to have to do for H. pylori. Um, it can cause gastric ulcers, peptic ulcers, of course, gastritis, that's the big thing. So let's go to Campylobacter jejuni, or some people like to call it affectionately chicken jejuni, because you're going to get it as fecal oral transmission through undercooked meat sometimes. All right, you can get it through livestock, like chickens. That's why I call it chicken jejuni. You can also get it from puppies, believe it or not. And some some very specific things on that is it's going to grow on a skiro auger, okay? Also, you're going to have bloody diarrhea with it, if you remember those bloodies to getting uh, cheeky with it. Oh, there's one. There we go. Do, do, do. Uh, the bloody diarrhea bacteria. If not, go back and review the first lecture. And it can cause Guillain Barre syndrome, okay? And like most things that are going to be uh, diarrhea, causing diarrhea flow, then you're going to do mostly supportive care. However, it can cause bloody diarrhea, and so you can give some macros with that as well. Let's get on over here to these. Now, here it gets a little complicated, okay? So what I want you guys to remember right offhand, okay, is to seek, notice how I spell seek, VIP, the I is for ignore, ships, notice how I spell ships, okay? And we're going to separate those two right there for a reason. Serratia marqueskins, it'll grow red on a culture due to the pigment prodox, protogosin. And so, you know, I can remember like rhodopsin, you know, red vision, those types of things. So I just know it's, a, it's, a, it's got a pigment to it that makes it grow red. And you're mostly going to see that in, you know, compromised people. It can grow on damp surfaces. Um, it can also grow uh, in dirty places. Places with dirt is what I mean by dirty. Um, let's see some other things about it. It can cause pneumonia and cause UTIs, but again, this is immunocompromised people. Citrobacter, we're not even going to talk about that one. Enterobacter, we're not going to talk about that one, sorry. Um, so let's go to E. coli. Before we get into E. coli, let's break these things down some, okay? I just wanted to go ahead and knock those out of the way. So 
when we get to gram negative bacilli, we want to know about if they're lactose fermenting or not. If they do, we're going to come over here and then see are they slow or fast. If they're slow, you go into this little zone where we don't really care. We don't really worry about those, right? If they're fast, then you're going to want to differentiate between Klebsiella, E. coli, and Enterobacter, mainly Klebsiella and E. coli for our purposes, okay? And so let's talk about E. coli for a second. When we talk about E. coli, we're talking about bringing out the big guns, okay? And the reason I say the big guns is because they cause GI distress, they cause UTIs, they can cause neonatal meningitis, okay? And they can cause sepsis. It's the most common rod, in fact, to, to cause sepsis. And so they are going to have a pili that is going to help it attach to surfaces. And also something that you'll want to know is this OH157. And what that's going to be is that's going to be the flagella, okay, through the O antigen. And you might want to look up E. coli just to familiarize yourself with all these things that I'm throwing out. If you're not totally familiar with them, it's going to be endole positive, as I talked about, EMB positive. Uh, one thing to differentiate between E. coli and Klebsiella is you can differentiate between those by endole because that's going to be negative. Klebsiella will be negative, whereas E. coli will be positive for that. Um, E. coli is going to grow pink on a McConkie's auger, meaning that it will ferment on that. It will ferment. Um, and then also, uh, sometimes you'll see that as the smack auger when they put sugar on it. Let's see some other things. E. heck form of E. coli, it, can ha it has a figa like toxin. And what we're talking about here is when we're differentiating between different types of E. coli, you have the traveler's diarrhea, which is going to be watery, also known as Montezuma's revenge. Then you have E. heck, which has a shiga light toxin, and that's going to be one of your E's for bloody diarrhea. And then you have E-I-E-C, which is invasive. So this is traveler's diarrhea, hemorrhagic diarrhea, invasive diarrhea. That one also will be one of your bloody diarrheas, and this one can also cause dysentery. All right. And so if you notice what we've got going on right here, then is we've got E-I-E-C has bloody diarrhea and dysentery, E-H-E-C, has bloody diarrhea and shigella, ETEC is going to have watery diarrhea, and all the commons that we talked about that go along with E. coli, the endole positive, the EMB, metallic green that we talked about, all of that. So definitely trying to get those in your head. Let's go on, move on now. <clears throat> and so uh, Klebsiella, uh, if you have pneumonia from that, then you're going to have, uh, oh, by the way, E. coli causing pneumonia, neonatal. Pneumonia, I can't remember if I said that or not, but with Klebsiella, if you have pneumonia, you're going to spit up this thick jelly-like sputum, and current jelly is kind of what is the going terminology for that. You're going to get it if you are if you contract a pneumonia nosocomially. It might be this one. It's also a community-acquired pneumonia and known as lobar pneumonia, so you'll get it all thick and coagulated in one lobe, possibly. I don't forget it's part of your capsule mnemonic, and you're going to get this one with diabetics and alcoholics, if you remember us going over that in the first lecture. So now, what about if you're lactose negative? Well, if you're lactose negative, we can't see if you're slow or fast, right, uh, process of lactose. So what we're going to do is see if you do oxidase or not. So for oxidase, you have the V and the P out of your VIP ships, okay? And so we have Vibrio. Now, Vibrio, you can get the vulnificus form, which is caused by shellfish, and it'll cause cellulitis or septicemias. Or you can get uh, parahemolyticus, Vibrio parahemolyticus. That's going to be caused by seafood, and it causes watery diarrhea, okay? And then the cholera is the big one that you'll see sometimes that's tested on. So if you get Vibrio cholera, you're going to just get a voluminous amount of diarrhea, okay, and it's going to be watery, it's known as rice water stools, and what that means is you'll see little mucus bits that's in your stool, okay, so it's rice water stools, and let's see, you get this a lot if you're out camping, or if you have like some type of flood damage going on around areas where you stay, and you're, let's just, yeah, that's pretty much about the about what we want to go over with that. Let's go over Pseudomonas now. So if you see the Pseudomonas, it's going to have a green-blue pigment to it. And something you can remember is to be pseudo to kind of get you started. Remember, Pseudomonas is definitely going to have the otitis externa. Okay. Um, something else right there is you're going to have the diabetic osteomyelitis. All right. Pseudomonas is associated with burns. 
as well. Um, some other things, it can cause endocarditis. Uh, it can cause pneumonia. I feel like I'm taking up a lot of time writing this stuff, but I'll go ahead and write it. Sepsis. And let's see. Uh, oh, I forgot my U there, didn't I? For UTIs. And then the other E is right there. And let's yeah, see. I think that that's actually where I put externa for otitis externa typically. And I'll say diabetic osteomyelitis for the O. So I apologize for jacking that up a little bit, but that's okay. I try to keep these videos in under 15 minutes, so sometimes I get a little ahead of myself. But anyhow, with pseudomonas, um, don't forget your anti-pseudomonal penicillins. Also, it's going to have a grape odor associated with it. Like I said, blue-green color on nutrient auger. It is going to be an aerobe, okay? And just remember, it is pseudomonas aeruginosa, so it tells you right there in the name, aerobe aeruginosa. And you're going to find that in water or in hospitals or moist soil. Those are going to be your three big areas there, water, hospitals, or moist soil, okay? And so now let's turn our attentions over here for those that are oxidase negative, all right? If they're oxidase negative, then we're going to differentiate a little further. And once again, guys, I hope you are drawing these things out because I can't stress enough how much that will help you. So when we go to the oxidase negatives one, we're going to look at whether they're modal or not, and that's where your ships comes in, okay? SH for Shigella, and then Y for Yersinia, and then you're going to separate that out with Proteus and Salmon. So let's talk this through. So Shigella is going to cause dysentery. It comes from fecal oral transmission, no hand washing, flies on your food can cause this. It is highly infectious at daycares, okay? And so you're going to want to give fluoroquinolone for this. This is the other one I told you about that has actin rockets to move around. That's why it's modal, just like Listeria. It has those actin rockets, okay? And so this one's going to grow yellow on macaques. So what does that mean? Well, it means that it does not ferment on macaques auger. does not ferment lactose like E. coli does. E. coli is going to be pink. Don't get that confused with what we were talking about mannitol uh, in one of the previous lectures. Staph aureus will grow yellow, meaning it will ferment mannitol. Staph epi will grow pink, meaning it will not, or it'll turn pink, meaning it will not ferment mannitol, okay? Let's see, something else with this one. Um, let's see, you're going to have a TSI auger um, on Shigella, and it'll have multiple colors. It'll be pink and yellow. It'll have a pink and yellow reaction, separating the acid from the base component. And Shigella, yeah, I think that's about it on it. Yersinia, you can have enterolytica. And so that is going to have cold growth. It's the one that can cause enterocolitis. It can cause uh, pseudoapenicitis in kids. All right. And then pestis is the big one on the Yersinius. That one has an antiphagocytic capsule. Remember that to even some nice killers, yada, yada, yada. This one was the one that was responsible for bubonic plague. You would have bubos that would appear typically in the axillary region and have a very high fever. It can cause pneumonia or septicemia as well as bloody diarrhea in some forms that is spread through rats and prairie dogs prairie dogs is the big way you would get it nowadays and it's spread via aerosols the thing about your senia also is it's going to have a safety pin appearance so if you want to when you draw this out kind of draw a safety pin there and the wire coming off like that because it will have a safety pin appearance to it and now let's go on over to those which are modal and you know what i have messed this up i severely apologize Okay, so these are modal and these are non-modal. I am so sorry. I don't know what I was thinking. Shigella and Yersinia, just to clarify, are non-modal. Salmonella and Proteus are modal. Proteus mirabilis, okay, is one of your urease ones. You can remember three S's, Proteus, like that, for S for struvite stones is what it causes in the kidney tract. Also, um, swarming motility, and it produces sulfur on the H2S. These are both going to be Salmonella and Proteus. They produce sulfur on H2S, and also they're going to be positive on a Houghton auger. All right, and so Proteus is urease producing as well, and um, like I said, you'll find it in the kidney tract. Salmonella, you have the typhoid fever form of it, and you also have enteritis uh, form of it, and you're going to get it from contaminated contaminated poultry from eggs. You can get it from pets like dogs or turtles or snakes. They're all reservoirs, and that will cause bloody diarrhea. And um, that will complete our gram-negative bacilli. Also, um, if you have typhoid fever, you'll get rose spots on your trunk and hepatosplenomegaly, and it can lead to murdering, muttering delirium. Excuse me. So that concludes it in under 15 minutes. I will talk to you guys next time. Thank you.